It's my pleasure to be able to speak at this uh, great conference. I think we had a very interesting morning, and I'm, I'm looking forward as well to the, the session following one on active investing. So in my talk today, I'm going to try to provide some perspectives on appropriate monetary policy and financial stability. So I'm going to start by arguing that over the past seven years, we have seen dramatic changes in the demand of, demand for, I should say, and supply of safe assets. And given these changes, the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, is only able to achieve its congressionally mandated objectives of maximum employment and price stability by taking actions to serve to keep the real, that is the net of inflation interest rate, well below its 2007 level. I suggest that these changes in uh, asset demand and asset supply are likely to persist over a considerable period of time, possibly the next five years or so. It follows that the FOMC will only be able to meet its objectives over that time frame by taking actions that ensure that real interest rates remain unusually low. So that's the first part of my picture is that in order to meet its congressionally mandated objectives of price stability and max employment, the uh, FOMC is going to have to take actions that will keep real interest rates low. I then go on to point out that low real interest rates are often associated with financial market phenomena that are seen as signifying instability. It follows that for many years to come, the FOMC will only be able to achieve its congressionally mandated objectives by following policies that may result in signs of financial instability. And I then just talk about how the FOMC should take those signs of financial instability into account when formulating monetary policy. Before going on, I, I need to stress that my remarks today reflect only my own views, and they're not necessarily those of any other FOMC participant. Okay, so let me start by talking about real interest rates. And, and uh, th this is, I'm sure, unusual, uh, uh, unnecessarily detailed for, for this crowd, but uh, uh, um, I think it, it's useful context nonetheless. So economists generally distinguish between nominal and real interest rates. Uh, the nominal interest rate is uh, the interest rate reported on a typical savings account or mortgage. And the real interest rate adjusts those future dollars uh, for the anticipated rate of price increases, that is, for the anticipated rate of inflation. So this means that the real interest rate is telling you how much purchasing power a saver or a lender is going to get in the future for giving up a dollar of purchasing power today. So. You know, when you start taking economics, um, you immediately are taught about real interest rates. Um, because as I'll mention in a second, that's what economists think of as really being the influence on, on decision making, uh, not, not, not the nominal interest rate. But when I was first a student in economics back in the 70s and the 80s, the real interest rate was this somewhat mysterious, unobservable object. But that's no longer true. Treasury inflation protected securities, uh, bonds that are colloquially called TIPS, make coupon payments that are indexed to the inflation rate. So this indexation means that TIPS coupon payments provide a fixed amount of purchasing power to the bondholder, not a fixed amount of dollars like uh, standard bonds do. Because they're providing a fixed amount of purchasing power, TIPS yields provide a useful measure of exactly what I was talking about earlier, the real interest rate. Okay. So when we look at TIPS yields, We've seen that the real interest rates have fallen sharply over the past six years or so, really seven years. In the first half of 2007, five-year tips had a real yield of about 2.5%, and 10-year tips also had a real yield of around 2.5%. By 2012, both real yields had fallen well below zero. Now, they've, since that date, they've risen back slightly but they continue to be low today. Five-year real tips uh, yield is still below zero. It's around negative 0.4%. The 10-year real tips yield is only slightly positive, around 0.3%. Now, if you put those two yields together, you can impute a five-year five-year forward real interest rate, and that's around 1%. So you take that minus 0.4% in the first five years, the point, 
um, positive 0.3 percent over the full 10 years, and that implies around a 1 percent uh, five-year, five-year forward real interest rate. And if you go, if you look further out in the yield curve, the 10-year, 10-year forward real interest rate is only slightly higher than that. So real interest rates have fallen a lot. Why have they fallen so much? So one answer you'll get immediately, the, 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 and at one level the answer is an obvious one, it's monetary policy. And over the past seven years, uh, the FOMC has taken a number of actions that are designed to put downward pressure on nominal bond yields. With inflationary expectations well anchored, these actions that push down on nominal yields translate directly into real yields because for keeping the inflation expectations fixed, push down on nominal yields, you're going to push down on real yields. But I think this obvious monetary policy answer is actually deeply misleading. And it's true that the FOMC takes monetary policy actions so as to influence the real interest rate. But ultimately, these actions are designed to allow the FOMC to achieve its dual mandate of price stability and maximum employment. So the FOMC is taking these actions in order to achieve certain goals. In particular, um, price stability uh, is translated as meeting, keeping inflation close to 2%. And, um, um, and maximum employment is uh, a little vaguer about what it means quantitatively, but certainly um, I think it's general agreement that um, um, the unemployment rate remains too high to be consistent with maximum employment. Now, if you go back to 2007, the macroeconomic outlook that existed at that point in time was broadly consistent with the committee's associated objectives, mandate, excuse me, uh, mandate objectives. So remember that in 2007, the real interest rate was 2.5%, yet that was consistent with a macroeconomic outlook that was, that was uh, uh, consistent with full price stability and max employment. In this sense, we can say that real interest rate at 2.5% was mandate consistent. Uh, in 2007. Now we f uh, roll forward to 2014. Now, I, I won't go through these arguments again today, but I've argued in previous speeches that the outlook for both employment and prices is too low relative to the Fed's goals. So, for example, the, the PC inflation rate, the personal consumption expenditure inflation rate, is currently running at 1.6%. And that's, so that's below the, the Fed's target of 2%, and I expect that to remain below 2% uh, for several years. This subdued outlook for both prices and employment suggests that the current path of real interest rates, even though it's lower than 2007, and markedly so, even though it's lower than that, it's actually too high relative to be consistent with the FOMC's mandated macroeconomic out, uh, outcomes. So I would argue that the mandate consistent real interest rate is even lower than is suggested by the current yield on TIPS bonds. Okay, so we had a mandate consistent uh, uh, real interest rate of 2.5% in uh, 2007. That's fallen, and it's, it's considerably lower than that now in, in 2014. What happened? Why did the mandate consistent path of real interest rates fall so much in the past seven years? And the answer is, is usually true in economics is about demand and supply. So I, I see the decline in the mandate consistent real interest rate is grounded in an increase in the demand for and a, a, a fall in the supply of safe financial investment vehicles. And the important thing is I see these changes as likely to be highly persistent. One of the things that's been challenging uh, to talk about this, uh, and when I, when I do talk about this, is you know, wh why, have the why has the mandate consistent real interest rate fallen so much? It's certainly uh, a question which, put different ways, I'm asked uh, quite often. And, the, and the, the reason it's hard to answer that is there's many factors that drive, have, have driven this change. And in particular, there are many factors underlying the uh, increased demand for safe assets. So what I'm going to do today is talk about three that strike me as particularly important. I'm sure you'll be able to think of others uh, uh, yourself. In fact, some of those were mentioned this morning. The three I'm going to talk about are tighter credit access, heightened perception of macroeconomic risk, and increased uncertainty about federal fiscal policy. 
We, we actually heard all three of these themes mentioned uh, in, uh, in, the, in the panels this morning. Now, in terms of uh, credit access, I don't think it's controversial to suggest that credit access is more limited today than it was in 2007. But I, I don't think it's as generally realized is that restrictions on households and businesses' ability to borrow typically lead them to spend less and to save more. So let me uh, talk through this uh, through an example. Suppose you have a household that wants to purchase a new home. In 2007, that household could have received a mortgage with a down payment of 10% of the purchase price or even lower. In 2014, that same household is considerably more likely to need a down payment of 20%. These tighter mortgage standards mean that to buy a similarly priced home, the household needs to first acquire more assets, needs to save more. And this is one of many kinds of examples you can give along the same lines. If you're not able to borrow, the way to respond to that is by accumulating more assets to save. So that tighter limits on credit access leads to a bigger demand for, for safe assets. Let me turn to the next factor, which I think is an important one. Households and businesses' assessments of macroeconomic risk. When you go back to 2007, the United States has just gone through nearly 25 years of macroeconomic tranquility. As a consequence, relatively few workers or businesses, even economists in the United States, saw a severe macroeconomic shock as a, a, relative, a, a relevant contingency to be taken into account. So that was in 2007. So th th this is when the people were talking about the great moderation and trying to explain why were things so calm. In the wake of the Great Recession and uh, the not so great recovery, the story is a different one. More workers see themselves as being potentially exposed to the risk of persistent deterioration in the labor incomes. More uh, businesses see themselves as being exposed to the risk of a radical and persistent downshift in the demand for their products. Now, when you're faced with these kinds of risks, there's a tendency not to spend, there's a tendency to save. These workers and businesses faced with these kinds of uh, risks in their mindsets have an incentive to accumulate more safe assets as a way to self-insure against this perception of uh, enhanced macroeconomic risk. So the, the final uh, um, point was uh, certainly we, uh, our first speaker this morning uh, emphasized uh, uh, throughout his remarks is the federal fiscal situation. And I think it's a third key source of ele elevated uncertainty. The federal government faces a long-run disconnect between its overt commitments and the baseline path of federal tax collections. This disconnect can only be resolved by raising taxes and or cutting the long-run arc of, uh, of spending. Now, this tension between revenues and expenditures predates the 2007 downturn. People have been talking about this for decades, literally decades. But I think it's at least arguable that the fiscal debates of the past few years and the, and the run-up of the debt during, the, during the, uh, the Great Recession have made more Americans aware of the uncertainties associated with resolving this long-run disconnect. And these uncertainties about how this disconnect is going to be resolved affects the demand for safe assets. The possibility of higher future taxes on corporate profits gives businesses an incentive to demand uh, safe short-term financial assets as opposed to engaging in long-term investments. The prospects of reductions in Medicare, Medicaid, or Social Security give some households an incentive to demand more safe assets as a way of replacing those lost potential benefits. So if you're not going to get insurance from the government uh, for, for, uh, um, for shocks that are going to hit you when you're older, you're going to have to save as a way to replace those, the, the, that lost insurance. So I've argued that, so, uh, I've argued that, uh, that due in part to tighter credit access and higher uncertainty, the demand for safe financial assets has risen since 2007. So that's the demand side of the equation. But let me turn now to the supply side. 
At the same time, the global supply of safe assets, or assets perceived as safe, more correctly, has also fallen. Americans and many others around the world thought in 2007 um, that it was highly unlikely that American residential land and assets backed by American residential land could ever fall in value by 30%. That's no longer true. Similarly, investors around the world viewed all forms of European sovereign debt uh, as a safe investment. And that's also no longer true. So we, we have a situation now where the Federal Open Market Committee is confronted with a greater demand for safe assets and a tighter supply of safe assets. What does these change in asset markets mean that at any given level of real interest rates, households and businesses spend less? The decline, this decline in spending pushes down on both prices and employment. And so the FOMC has to lower the real interest rate to achieve its, its dual mandate objectives set forth by Congress. So I think it's a very important point because I often hear that the FOMC has created a low interest rate environment that's harmful for savers and others. My view is, is very different from this. In my view, like savers, the FOMC is being forced to make unusual decisions by an unusual economic environment that is not of its own making. The FOMC has been confronted with a significant increase in safe asset demand and a significant fall in safe asset supply. Faced with these changes, the committee can only achieve its macroeconomic objectives by taking actions to push down the real interest rate. So in other words, the, the reason the real interest rate is being lowered is in order to achieve these goals, and in fact, for prices and employment. Indeed, as I argued earlier, the subdued outlook for prices and employment that we see going forward suggests that the FOMC's actions have not lowered the real interest rate sufficiently. So that's right now. What about the future? So I, the passage of time is going to ameliorate these changes in demand for and the supply of safe assets. But, but that amelioration, I think, will only be a partial one. Any long-run forecast has enormous attendant uncertainties. But I expect that for a considerable period of time, possibly the next five years or more, credit market access will remain uh, uh, limited relative to what borrowers had available in 2007. I expect that many workers and businesses will remain more concerned than in 2007 about the risk of a large adverse shock. And I also expect that businesses will continue to feel a heightened degree of uncertainty about future taxes, and households will continue to feel a heightened degree of uncertainty about the level of federal government benefits that they're, they're going to receive. These considerations suggest that for, for many years to come, the FOMC will have to maintain low real interest rates to achieve its congressionally mandated goals. So I see this conclusion as broadly consistent with the April uh, FOMC statement. So the April FOMC statement includes a, a, a in this last paragraph, a, a prediction that the target Fed funds rate will remain low for some time after inflation and employment are near mandate consistent levels. And I'm describing to you why that would be, be true is because of these persistent changes in asset demand and asset supply. And I want to turn to the consequences of this situation. So I've argued that for some time to come, um, the FOMC is going to have to ke keep the time path of real interest rates considerably lower than 2007 if it's going to achieve its dual mandate outcomes. Uh, and in fact, I, I, this is a quantitatively noticeable difference. It, the, I would say the time path of real interest rates that's mandate consistent is as much as two full percentage points lower than it was in 2007. What about the consequences for broader financial market conditions? My main point is that these unusually low real interest rates are likely to be associated with other unusual financial market outcomes. And there's going to be a lot of these. I'm going to talk again only about three 
but uh, but others but others might occur to you as as you listen to me. The first, uh, the three of these I'm going to talk about are inflated asset prices, unusually volatile asset returns, and high merger activity. So the first consequence of low real interest rates that I mentioned, higher asset prices, is the most obvious. Long lived assets are somewhat substitutable for each other. So investors generally respond to low real yields on bonds by bidding up the price of other long-lived assets, including gold, land, stocks, machines. It follows that when real interest rates are unusually low by historical norms, asset prices will also typically be unusually high relative to historical norms. So that's the first one. It's like you know, standard textbook application of the Gordon formula. The second consequence of low real interest rates is the asset returns should be expected to be highly volatile. When the real interest rate is very high, only the near term matters to investors. So variations in an asset's price only reflect changes in investors' information about the asset's uh, near term dividends or risk premium. When the real interest rate is unusually low, then an asset's price becomes correspondingly sensitive to uh, changes in the infor in, to, uh, to information about dividends or risk premia in the distant future. Okay, so when you have a high real interest rate, that's basically killing off the, 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 the value of those future payments that are far off in the future. They're being discounted by a very high, uh, high real interest rate. But when it's low, that discounting effect is not there. So now, you're, as an investor, you're going to have to worry about, even a long-term investor, you're going to have to worry about uh, information about dividends or risk premium in the, in the distant future. So this new source of relevant information should be expected to induce, typically induce more variability into asset prices and returns. Finally, when real interest rates are low, uh, I, I would think you, we should expect to see more mergers. A merger typically involves enduring some kind of current costs in exchange for a flow of future benefits. So uh, again, there are many of these kinds of costs, but one example would be to initiate the merger. The acquiring firm has to search for an appropriate target. That search can be costly. As well, after the merger, it's, it may well be necessary to undertake a costly one-time reorganization of people and materiel in order to get those, those gains in revenue. And businesses are just going to be more willing to pay that upfront cost of the merger to get those future benefits if the real interest rate is low. So they, these are just three outcomes that you should expect to see when you see unusually low real interest rates. Inflated asset prices, high asset return volatility, and heightened merger activity. All these financial market outcomes are often interpreted as signifying financial market instability. So this observation brings me to a con key conclusion. I've suggested that it's likely that for a number of years to come, the FOMC will only achieve its dual mandate outcomes of max employment and price stability if its actions are able to keep real interest rates low. But if real interest rates are low, we're also likely to see financial market outcomes that signify instability. Logically, it follows that the FOMC is only going to be able to achieve its macroeconomic objectives in association with signs of financial market instability. OK, so what does this mean for monetary policy? The issue is that these financial market phenomena could pose macroeconomic risks. Now, in my view, such potentialities are best addressed through effective supervision and regulation of the financial sector. That should be our first line of defense about how financial market instability spills over to affect the broader macroeconomy. But you don't want to be, you know, even though the situation might be the best you could hope for, it may not occur. And these tools may only partially mitigate, these tools referring to supervisory and regulatory tools, may only partially mitigate the relevant macroeconomic risks. How, if at all, should the FOMC adapt monetary policy in response to any residual risk? 
Now, I, in remarks I gave earlier this year in, in March, I described an analytical mean variance framework that the committee could use to answer this question of how to take residual risks from financial instability into account uh, in making monetary policy. T today, I'm just going to sketch the elements of this, this framework. The key is that the FOMC should take on board financial instability in the making of monetary policy insofar as that instability is creating risks to the achievement of the FOMC's price and employment goals. So that creates a probabilistic cost-benefit uh, calculation. On the one hand, raising the real interest rate will definitely lead to lower employment and prices. On the other hand, raising the real interest rate may reduce the risk of a financial crisis, a crisis that could give rise to a much larger fall in employment and prices. So on the one hand, you've got the, when you raise real interest, you've got the certainty of giving up ground in terms of your dual main objectives of prices and employment. But you do have the benefit of reducing the probability of an even larger deviation from those objectives. So this is the, the mean variance uh, trade-off that I, I, uh, I described earlier this year. Now, right now, I think this cost-benefit as benefit assessment is relatively clear. As I mentioned earlier, I see employment and prices as, uh, uh, I expect them to continue to be low over the medium term. In these circumstances, the cost of tightening policy um, has to be seen as great. At the same time, when you go to the survey of professional forecasters, those forecasters see little chance of a large downward movement in, in employment and prices. So if you take those forecasts, they suggest that there would be little gain in terms of forestalling adverse macroeconomic outcomes for monetary policy tightening. If there's a chance of a crisis that's going to affect the macroeconomy, it should be showing up in forecasters' <laughs> predictions of an of a, of a adverse shock to the, to the, to the macroeconomy. So I think that assessment right now is, is, is not that hard. I think it's going to become more difficult as time unfolds. Eventually, the outlook for employment and prices will improve to be broadly consistent with the FOMC's objectives. But I as I've described, I expect the real interest rate will still be unusually low at that juncture. In these circumstances, I anticipate that financial stability considerations are likely to play a substantial role in the determination of the appropriate level of monetary accommodation. Now, I should stress that the committee is in a better position to carry out this kind of probabilistic cost-benefit analysis than it was in 2014 than it was in 2007, 2006, 2005, et cetera. The Federal Reserve System now dedicates a significant amount of our best staff resources to financial st uh, system surveillance. And the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, in particular, contributes to these efforts in a, a number of ways. As a result of these efforts, the FOMC has a lot more information on an ongoing basis about the extent of financial system risks. Now, I, with, with that said, I want to be clear. There's still more to be learned. We need to understand better, in light of the current state of supervision regulation, which financial, residual financial system risks have the potential to translate into macroeconomic risks. And we need to understand better to what extent monetary policy tightening can, in fact, temper those residual financial system risks. There's no point in, in tightening policy if you're not actually going to uh, temper the risks that, uh, to the financial system. Let me wrap up. I certainly want to leave time for, for questions. Over the past seven years, uh, there have been big changes in the demand for and supply of safe assets. These changes seem likely to be persistent. And they mean, they mean that the FOMC may need to keep real interest rates unusually low for years if it is to achieve uh, its objectives of max employment and price stability. And I see this con conclusion is broadly consistent with what the FOMC said in its uh, 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 April statement about uh, the, uh, the likely path of, of interest rates. It follows that to attain maximum employment and price stability over the same long period of time, Americans will likely face the consequences of low real interest rates. I've emphasized the consequences related to financial market instability, consequences like inflated asset prices, volatile asset returns, 
and heightened merger activity. Even in the presence of effective supervision regulation, these phenomena could pose residual macroeconomic risks. The FOMC's decision about whether to respond to those residual risks using the rather blunt tool of monetary policy tightening will necessarily depend on a delicate, probabilistic cost-benefit calculation. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to taking your questions.